Um, so I'm Leslie Ross Tyron, and will be your webinar facilitator today. Um, I'm a, a HR and OD um, consultant and also a business growth coach um, for AGP. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to talk about equality, diversity and inclusion. And um, before we get going with that, though, I thought um, it would be useful just to have a quick um, run through the session and also then to do some introductions. So just to prepare you for the fact that I'm going to ask you all just to give a short um, introduction. And um, I can see it looks like you might be having problems connecting to audio, so we might not be able to hear from you. Um, but so we're just going to run through so the benefits of EDNI, just so that you can um, kind of get a full appreciation of what some of those benefits are. Because um, I think everybody knows it's something we should be doing, but they don't always think about what the benefits are for us as a business. And um, then just some um, definitions and some understanding about what equality and diversity and inclusion mean. We can talk a little bit about unconscious bias. I'm sure you will have come across this previously. And um, if you haven't, then it's really just kind of looking at we, 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 a lot of us understand what direct discrimination, for example, might look like, but we don't always recognise the stuff that we're less um, consciously aware of. So just a brief bit about that. I'm talking about how you might monitor um, EG&I within your companies, particularly when you're smaller businesses. Sometimes the big monitoring forms and things aren't always the practical ways that you might want to monitor. And then just some steps as to what you might do if you come across something that you think you might want to change. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about microaggression. Again, just a brief introduction to this. Um, it is something, again, you might have come across, um, but it is something that is, I think, find that businesses find very useful um, in the sense that what it is, is it's, it's saying things that we used to might have called banter in the organisation, particularly when you were looking at whether something was appropriate or not be appropriate behaviour. Often what would come up was, oh, you know, it's just a bit of banter. Um, but actually, we're going to it's it, now it is a, a, officially a term microaggression. And um, we're going to have a little bit of look at that. And then just a few um, sort of definitions and appropriate terms for you. And um, because, again, sometimes we come across this terminology and we don't always know what it means. So just to add some helpful um, hints really around what some of that is. Um, and we, I can ask you if there's anything in particular that you want me to, to go through. And then um, exactly as Lisa said, we'll have a Q&A session. So if I can ask you first, each of you, to just tell me who you are, um, what your business is, and maybe one thing that you'd like to take away from this session. Um, can I ask you, Laura, um, first, just because you're first on my, on my list. Oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, so my name is Laura Sanderson and I work at Gen Power Limited. Um, so we're a family-run business based in Pembroke Dock, um, and we are the um, distributors um, for Hyundai Power Products and um, for the UK and Ireland, and more recently, um, JCB Power Products and Power Tools. Um, so um, the aim of us today is just to gain a bit more insight um, and knowledge around equality and diversity. Um, it's something that we want to focus on a bit more in the business in 2023. Um, and um, we run some conversations this morning around how it will build into sort of our people plan and thing. So it's more just trying to get some additional knowledge and insight for us today. Okay, brilliant, great. And um, there's loads of different things that you could be doing around that, Laura. So also happy to have a chat as you're developing that if there's any way I can help with that. Okay, and then Nicola, I've got you next on my list. Hi all, um, so I'm Nicola, I'm, I work in the same business as Laura. So thanks Laura, you've just done a bit of the introduction around Gen Power Press, which is great. So, and, so for me, I just wanna uh, just make sure that we're doing everything we should be doing from a framework perspective, I guess. And if Laura and, and Lewis who work within our HR department need any support from me, then um, now and again, I jump onto these types, and I find them quite useful. So I jump onto these types of, um, uh, learning sessions really to make sure that yeah we're doing everything we can and and to support with the people plan moving forward for the next well year plus really I suppose brilliant that's great thank you very much Nicola thank you and then who have I got next I've got Emma it looks like you might have connected to audio now Emma uh, hi Leslie we've got two messages on the on the chat there uh, that she doesn't have Michael camera she works for Kotec Co a flooring contractor in the construction sector. And then Sophia um, doesn't have a microphone or camera. She works for Madden Trigwent, woolen fabric manufacturer, retailer, 
and attending to gather information to feed back to the management team. Brilliant. Great. I thought I recognised your name, Sophia, and now I know where I know you from. OK, no problem at all, um, guys. Absolutely fine. And, and uh, there aren't too many um, questions, um, but there might there might be some. So, again, I wasn't keeping an eye on the chat, but I will have a look. If you can't respond verbally, by all means, if you want to put a couple of points in the chat, then I will keep an eye on that. OK, so benefits of um, equality. Uh, diversity and inclusion for you as the business. So as you can see there, um, the benefits are to make the business more successful because when you're thinking about how um, everybody's different, everybody comes from a different background, has different knowledge and to share and different experiences, you can really appreciate how much more successful that could make you as a business, having that much more diverse input um, particularly um, around creativity, around taking the business potentially in different directions. Um, and so what that leads to, if you've got good engagement as a company, you're much more likely to have motivated staff. They're going to feel valued. And if you're empowering them in the way you communicate with them, you're empowering them because of the way that you're role modelling around dd and i and, um, and the say that they have in that and how they perform their roles, then that can absolutely um, make the business much more successful. They're going to be happier um, in work because of this for the same reasons. They feel included. So you're communicating with staff. You've got clear channels where they know that they can um, contribute and their, their opinions and their views are sought, then that they're going to be much happier about what they're doing because usually they've got buy-in um, in terms of the direction that the business is taking. And obviously, there's the, the compliance stuff around bullying and harassment um, and, and discrimination, for example. Um, but, you know, and, and of course, they are very serious issues that, that companies need to be aware of. But that is just compliance. That's not the added value that um, ED and I will bring to you as a business. Um, and I always say to people when I, I work with them on, on ED and I um, work packages, actually, sometimes it's not just thinking about your approach to ED and I where your staff are concerned, but also where your customers are concerned. Because if anything um, tells me a business is doing this well, it's where their customers will also be representative of the local population or representative of the reach of that business, um, rather than just we're serving customers who look like us. Um, and, and if you've got a, a company where you, you're more diverse, um, customers want to find some work with people that they can relate to, work with people who they've got common interests. We all think about discussions you have with clients. Um, it, it's not all business. There's always personal aspects that will come into it. Um, and businesses will, if they can feel that there's that relatability in terms of culture, in terms of diversity, they're much more likely to um, use you as a company. So, so it can have those um, those benefits as well and as I said you know coming up with lots of different ideas if you if, if everybody's come from a shared background for example think about the um, the curriculum in, in Wales in schools and even in the UK more generally um, you know a lot of us have been um, taught about so lots of similar subjects so you've got lots of group lots of people together some of their school backgrounds for example might be quite similar their knowledge might be quite similar take somebody from a different culture who's had a completely different um, background different um, tra school training different curriculum again different ideas different experiences different approaches to problem solving um, and it just makes things so much more exciting and creative um, and you're much more likely to get people coming from different approaches and for me I think again where you're you've got good engagement you've got good approach to um, diversity as a company so your public image um, is showing and your policies are, are showing that you're you're very um, positive around diversity and inclusion um, and I'll talk about those, what those mean in more detail obviously and then you're much more likely to attract staff because people will look at you as an employer and say, what are you offering? Who, who are you as a company? What's your public image? And you're going to retain good people as well if you've got that more inclusive approach, approach that, that mindset that means that I'm not going to stand out in any way. I, I feel included. Even if, even if um, you know, my contribution is completely unique to somebody else's, 
that is valued within the company and not seen as a standalone opinion, for example. So um, what about um, quality? Does anybody want to, to have a little stab at what they think equality means? You can just speak freely. Anybody who wants to, we'll put it in the chat. Okay, nobody wants to volunteer and that's fine because actually I sometimes find that um, people I don't always understand the distinction between the three of diverse of equality and diversity and, and inclusion. If it stood alone, people might might be able to say what they thought it meant. But when you put it with the other two, sometimes it can be harder to really be clear about what's the difference between the three terms. So equality is very much about eliminating disadvantage and discrimination. Um, and there's been much more of a social justice um, spin or um, kind of the interpretation around equality over the last few years. So even um, deprivation and social economics has, has become much more important about um, people's wealth um, rather than just actually what we would often see as the areas where we look at areas of protected characteristics, for example. Um, so it's about, it's about um, eliminate, eliminating disadvantage um, discrimination, deprivation, and also treating people fairly. Now, within a workplace context, as you can see, this is about having equal job opportunities and fairness for employees and job applicants in new jobs, in promotions, um, in how they're treated um, within the workplace. So we know, most people know, from a compliance perspective, you can't treat people unfairly because of reasons protected by discrimination. So if you're going to... Um, treat somebody differently because of their sex or their age or their race in a way people think well that's kind of more obvious isn't it um, but actually and um, sometimes some of these things are less obvious to us and that's where it's useful to have this this kind of training I think to understand okay where are those less obvious areas we're going to have a look at some kind of practical um, areas where you could think about um, making sure that you're, you're, you're being more inclusive, for example. So, and it may be about around making statements. So it might say that you might say everybody of um, working age uh, are given equal access to all of our employment, our training and development and promotion opportunities. So being open about the fact that just because somebody, um, for example, might be at you know, at the entry level of working age, so a younger person, that you might um, think, oh, well, they're not going to have the skills experience. It doesn't matter. It's up to them, isn't it, to say what they think that they can bring to the table or where their potential is. Um, and, and then with, with um, old people who are, we think of as being like closer to the end of their career, again, sometimes people think, well, we're not going to train them or they're not going to be interested in promotion. So we're not going to necessarily kind of tell them about these opportunities. So it seems simple but when you think about it sometimes through those lenses um, actually sometimes we do make assumptions and we do think oh we're doing it because we think people won't be interested or they might not qualify anyway but actually you make it completely inclusive and people can either opt in or they can opt out thinking about disability um, you know you might say or well, you know we'll provide any reasonable adjustments that to make sure that disabled people have got access to our services and opportunities and um, will challenge discriminatory assumptions about disabled people um, but actually it might be going further than that and saying actually we want to do surveys around disability and say what is it that people need you know just should we be thinking about installing loop systems should we have braille facilities for um, certain um, certain um, pieces of work for example or alternative formatting um, or even sign language interpretation. So it's, and again, sometimes some of those things might come out or, um, as part of your discussions with your staff. They might not. I mean, I was doing some training like this last week and so one of the senior managers said to me, actually, I've got a hearing problem, but I've never really said to anybody um, that I could do with some adjustments because I just kind of get on with it. It hasn't really occurred to me that maybe they, the company should be making some changes to make that easier for me I just think I should just get on with it um so it's about maybe just asking the questions sometimes is there anything we could do to improve things um for you and around um race so you know we might say well, you know we, we um we actively promote um, race equality in the company for example but sometimes that might be seen as lip service 
to actually talk more meaningfully about how will we challenge racism where it occurs? What will we do about it? Um, how are you going to show that you'll respond swiftly and sensitively to any potentially racist incidents that happen? Because it's those sorts of reassurances that people are going to find um, get them find more reassuring to just a statement around how we actively promote equality in the company. And then around um, sex, so trying to look at where you can take positive action to redress the negative effects of discrimination. So you might look at, um, you know, people, you know that largely um, primary caregivers tend to be women, and so they tend to take more time out of business for maternity leave and things like that. So how can you make sure that the experience, for example, that they might lose out on when they're out of the business is not... Um, when you're then looking at, we, we often get this come up, you know, we might want a job where somebody's got five years experience, for example, in a role. Um, and a woman might say, well, you know, well, I've probably got three, but I was on maternity leave. And then I was working really part time coming back into the business. Or So so try to look at where can we make sure that we're not um, adding an area of discrimination, even completely unintentionally, something that seemed like it was equi equitable who's got five years experience for example might then be um, seem to be less um less equitable actually in practice um and gender reassignment so again you might say well we're going to provide support to prevent discrimination against um transsexual people or um or who, um, people who are transsexual who are about to undergo gender reassignment but actually where i find uh, businesses who are most supportive around gender reassignment are where they actually go in and do um, work with um, individuals, other individuals in the company to change their mindset and to challenge their assumptions about gender reassignment. Rather, sorry, my doorbell shut off. Sorry, once she starts, you can't always shut her up. Um, yeah, so rather than actually saying, um, you know, we, we, we'll, yeah, we'll do everything we can to help you feel like you fit into our team, actually train everybody else so that they make sure that they um, fit into that team um, and challenge, those challenge some of those assumptions that people have. Um, sexual orientation, um, again, you know, generally, you know, much more um, accepted uh, within the business. We, you know, we, we, we tend to come a lot across a lot less. Um, challenge around sexual orientation but still um, you know there are areas um, where you, issues do arise so it's about making sure that everybody knows that the expectation is that everybody will be treated with dignity and respect um, and religion or belief um, make sure um, it, you know it's a lot of the time businesses don't always have the knowledge about what different religions people might have what that means in practice um, a practice I came across the other day, a company were doing, we're looking at bank holidays, for example, and saying we might um, allocate um, a number of bank holidays if people want to not have those bank holidays and instead take them on Eid, for example, or something like that, then we will will let people take their bank holidays on a different date. Um, so it, it's thinking about, again, how inclusive you can be um, around that area. Um, and then pregnancy or maternity, again, we know there's, there's compliance areas. But have a look at where can you make sure that people are treated with um, respect and dignity around the area of pregnancy and maternity, making sure that you've got positive images and positive role models within businesses when people go through um, pregnancy or maternity as a business, um, as individuals, uh, rather than because it, it's, a, it's something that happens for a short period for people. There's almost not adjustments made always. Um, to think, well, this is something that happens in a business on a on a regular basis. Just make sure that nobody's disadvantaged in any way because of um, pregnancy or maternity. And then marriage and civil partnership. I think one of the main areas really is about um, making sure that as a company you've got a really positive image. And some of this is around your language when it comes to the comparison between marriage and civil partnership. That they're seen as interchangeable, interchangeable maybe rather than um, marriage, we see marriage as standing for this and civil partnership standing for that. Um, and just make sure that no one's um, disadvantaged because they might have chosen one route over another, um, for example. So then um, having a look at um, diversity. Um, so I'll just go in and, and tell you about that. So this is about um, diversity, as we can see, is quite different from equality because diversity is about 
understanding the background and beliefs of the people within your workforce, for example. So obviously this is in a workforce context. Um, it's recognising that everyone's different in a variety of visible and non-visible ways and that those differences are to be recognised and respected and valued. And actually in some businesses, when we look at in inclusion, actually those things are celebrated. Um, and I think for diversity, that's where it's really important to recognise that, um, you know, yes, you've got your areas of compliance, but actually this is about celebrating those differences, not thinking of them as hurdles almost that, that we need to get over. So um, one area that we come across um, around diversity um, often is um, bullying and harassment. So sometimes we, we'll have um, people's, people's background, their beliefs, might be their protected characteristics, um, may, may lead to um, allegations of bullying or harassment or, and, and dis or discrimination. So what as a business you can do um, to avoid um, these sorts of claims is make sure that your workforce and your managers absolutely understand what's protected by discrimination law. So make sure that everybody properly understands it. And again, sometimes it's about challenging assumptions, not just talking about it in compliance terms, because people, people think with compliance, oh, it's just box ticking. We're just being told this because, you know, we have to tick a box. The company has to tick a box. Actually make sure people understand it, challenge their assumptions about what um, protected characteristics actually are and what that means in practice. Um, make sure that they do understand that under discrimination law, what's actually happening in your workplace is what should be happening. So again, this is where we'll come to looking at kind of monitoring and some different things that you can do. And if you come across things that are happening that's not expected, um, then make changes. Um, step up staff training in some way. Focus on, again, exactly what you can do to make sure that people's understanding is what it should be and potentially is not putting your business at risk because that's often what happens. It's people's naivety or lack of training that sometimes means that as a business, you might be put at risk in around these areas. And make sure that managers and people in the company understand, again, the benefits of diversity and having people from different backgrounds. And again, modeling that in practical ways in your company. So have you know case studies, or again, it's about your public imagery, what's in your literature, what's on your website, What's the representation of your um, senior leadership team and your managers, for example? Because um, those are the sorts of things that people will really um, take notice of and they really add to that cultural change. And then by the term inclusion. So this is about, um, I mean, in a workplace where everyone feels valued, everyone feels that they can come up with different ideas and they're not going to get shot down. Um, because everything that people bring to the table that's different is celebrated rather than, oh, it's not really the direction we were going in. Um, you know, think about how you engage with staff and how you make sure that they feel that what they say is valued. Even if, you know, overall that isn't something that you, you, you choose to take account of, make sure they understand why that is. So, you know, thank you for the contribution. It's great. It's just, it's not something that it might be, it's not something that we're, we're a priority right now, but we're definitely going to be, um, you know, encouraging and including it. Like you were just saying, um, Laura Nicola around, you know, next year, a piece of work next year, it'd be great to do a load of engagement and then say, great, we're going to include all of this in, you know, what we're looking at next year. Um, and and raise issues and suggestions to managers so that people, staff can do this in their one-to-ones, in other um, forums and meetings that you've got that people can raise these things knowing that it's encouraged um, rather than being frightened that they're going to be knocked back for raising raising things that are different from what people usually come up with for suggestions because you everybody knows that if you knock people back for making suggestions that are outside of what you normally um, deal with as a company then people are not going to come up with fresh ideas and new suggestions otherwise so if you think, again, you've got concerns with how managers deal with some of those things sometimes, you know, give them some training to, to be able to um, deal with those sorts of things that maybe they might not want to take forward or that they don't really recognise the value of so that they can think about actually, is there another way of dealing with this or responding to it that might be more positive? 
you know, again, good, good internal communications, making sure that if people do raise issues, that they're dealt with in, in a really supportive way. And just try doing things differently to the way they've done before. You know, think about sometimes people do this, they might turn their um, management meetings upside down and say, we're going to have a completely different way of doing it for this session to see how that works. Or we're going to have um, an open staff forum where we're just going to allow them to ask anything at all once a month or um, to encourage any contribution that people might make. Or you know, I know suggestions boxes are very old school, um, but, you know, something that uh, something similar where people can perhaps come up with anonymous suggestions, maybe because not everybody wants what they say to be heard by everybody else but again it encourages a more creative approach um, to you as an organization and and ways in which you can um, be more inclusive as a business might be you know having um, an equality and diversity policy that really outlines your commitments so people know you, you this is what you're saying that you will do and then obviously they're going to you know keep hold you to account for that Make sure you've got um, a quality and diversity policy that helps people to know that business supports and treats everyone fairly. They know what kind of behaviour is expected of them. They know what discrimination and the law is and what's not acceptable. And they also know where procedures are if there are problems um, and, and they want to resolve things. And I would say consider having an inclusive language policy. I would definitely say, Laura, um, from what you're looking at for next year, that's something I've seen um, lately, some really great examples of inclusive language policies, which, again, it's talking about the stuff that people feel uncomfortable talking about. They're not quite sure. Am I meant to say this? Can I say that anymore? Is that still PC? Um, an inclusive language policy really helps everybody to understand what is PC, what's not PC, um, but also what's kind of generally acceptable. And, and it's really helpful for everyone to be able to have that common understanding. Um, think about developing an action plan to say, OK, how are we going to get staff on board? What training are we going to do? How are we going to best monitor if our what we're putting in pra into practice in the policy is actually working um, in practice? Um, and how are we going to make changes if, if you know, we do um, come across changes? And who's going to be responsible for the policy and how are we going to review it? You know, all of that stuff. So kind of put together an action plan around that. And then look at, as I said, you know, when we're recruiting new staff, how are we going to um, build ED and i in by design when we're recruiting staff from the beginning? How are we going to train um, our existing staff? And when we're promoting staff, how are we again going to put that ED and i by design into that practice? Have we got equal pay? Are we comfortable that we understand what that means and, um, and that we have got it in place? Do we, what was our understanding of the religious makeup of our staff? Have we, um, have we got everything in place that they would want? And if not, let's ask them what, what we haven't got that they would like. Have we got a dress code? Is our dress code inclusive? Or is it, you know, a, kind of, again, an older school version of, something that we deemed was appropriate maybe 20 years ago do we really does that really need to be reviewed what do we think is unacceptable behavior and for me these are great team discussions you could be having um, as a you know what do we think is acceptable as a team what do we not think is acceptable and that can be a great way of getting that discussion about where are the assumptions what's people's understanding of what's acceptable and then as a company shaping that you know, these are, this is what we've all agreed um, that we're going to do and how we're going to behave. Um, you know, around dismissal, making sure that ED&I is very clear and um, what's acceptable, what's not, what we will do about it. Give people assurances that if they are exposed to unacceptable, um, you know, um, racist or discriminatory behaviour, that it will be taken seriously. In redundancy, make sure you're thinking about the quality impact assessing, for example, your approach to redundancy is um, is it in every way fair? Have you taken, when you're scoring and measuring things in redundancy, have you taken um, EDI elements into account? Um, thinking about different types of leave for, leave for parents, for carers, flexible working. I mean, some of those things are statutory and you'll be doing them anyway, but think about is there anything you can be doing over and above what's statutory? Internal communication, as I said before, 
you need people to be getting on board with your organization's purpose and, and value. So they're going to do that if they feel valued, if they understand what as an organization you stand for, and they really, truly get how they play a part in, in, in helping you to achieve your goals. Um, so talking openly with them, making sure that they know how the business is doing, what any changes are coming up, what decisions or plans um, might be in place. And leadership role modeling, um, absolutely. So that you're always modeling inclusive behavior, uh, making sure that you're encouraging everyone to have a more inclusive attitude, that you make sure managers are trained, they understand their, the importance of um, shaping your workplace culture, um, have a maybe equality, diversity and inclusion champions at a senior level who can perhaps stand up um, and speak for underrepresented groups and flag any issues that might need addressing. And obviously, um, always look out for signs of discrimination, equality, inequality um, and exclusion and make sure that you address them as soon as possible. So let's have a look at a little bit of a look around unconscious bias. So as I said, you know, we, we often think about ed &I from a compliance perspective. Um, and actually, sometimes it is the less conscious, less obvious discrimination sometimes that happens. Um, and how someone thinks um, can very much will depend on their life experiences. And they might have beliefs and views about other people that might not be right or reasonable, um, but they're held subconsciously often. And sometimes what we need to do, particularly as a company, is to look to bring them out into our more conscious thinking so that they're not unfairly impacting on our decision, decision making. So, you know, when we um, demonstrate unconscious bias, what we often do is we might think better of someone because that we think that they're like us. And so we automatically put them up in our estimations. We, we get this in recruitment often. Um, those of you who have responsibility for recruitment will know this. You often will um, seek to recruit someone like you because you can see a bit of yourself in them. It's an unconscious thing. You're not necessarily doing it actively, but you've made that link, that common interest um, in some way. And sometimes, for some reason, you then almost feel like they're, 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 you, they go up in your estimation compared to some other people that you haven't necessarily made those connections with. Um, or because somebody has something different, um, sometimes you might again also see them as somebody as lesser than you because you can't relate to that. You can't understand it in some way. So then you could be making your decisions based on that false belief or assumptions or a stereotype of what you think um, somebody's bringing to the table. So everyone um, thinks in a, in a way that involves unconscious bias at some point. And sometimes you've got to cognitively check yourself on that. Um, sometimes you've got to have uh, practices in place to help you um, to make sure that as a group of people, maybe you can be checking one another around unconscious bias. But it's just important that you're aware of it and you don't let it affect um, your behaviour or your decision making. So, you know, apart from very limited circumstances allowed in law, employers and employees um, mustn't make decisions about job applicants based on a protected characteristic. Um, Doing so could lead to a discrimination claim. Although sometimes what we might do is we might say we could potentially have positive um, action, which is where you might, um, you've got two people who score exactly the same um, in the recruitment process, um, but one person from a less representative group than you've got elsewhere in the company. So let's say you're like 75% female, 25% male, two people score exactly the same. You may decide. On, um, to recruit the male on the basis that you've got a less representative um, of, of men in, within the company, that, that would um, be acceptable as long as they are scoring exactly the same um, up to that point. Um, so, oh, someone got to ask a question. Yeah, now. sorry, just got a question on that, if that's okay. Um, it's one thing we discussed actually was um, around introducing it as part of our application process and things mm. like that, because we don't currently gather data um in terms of like gender race religion um, and everything like that but one thing that I've always been a bit conscious of is yes yeah, sort of like bringing in the underrepresented group but on the flip side can that be seen as tokenism it absolutely can be seen as tokenism 
Um, and sometimes it can be directly discriminatory as well. Yeah. And there's a, a big case in the police force where um, the police force is, you know, a lot of reputational damage around um, racism, for example, misogyny. Um, and so what they've done is they said, oh, we want to recruit more women. We want to recruit more people of colour. Um, and, yeah. and so that, you know, that, that they, they've kind of positively done that. And then they've been sued by um, white people because it is absolutely discriminatory to do that it's finding the balance um, isn't it <laughs> it is exactly right so what you have to do is you have to have a fair and equal process um going through now what that sometimes means is you may make adjustments so for example for disability people um, a person with disability you can make an adjustment to make sure that where they they may have an impairment that means that they would be um measured less um, in the recruitment process for example you know we know making adjustments to interviews and things like that um, you might be able to make changes to make sure that you're balancing that um, equality but what you can't do is say we haven't got any disabled people who work for the company so whatever happens um, we're going to recruit a disabled person yeah you, you can't you can't do that a lot of companies do say we'll guarantee you an interview um, if you're disabled and again, that's a kind of a positive action, um, a disability awareness that is accepted practice. But again, what you're not saying is you're going to be treated more favourably when we're actually um, you know, going into the selection process. Mm. Thank you. Um, we, we find it quite often on the gender side more than anything because mm. we're, we're not intentionally, but we're quite a male heavy environment. Um, and that's sort of across... Well, even sort of our, our management team, um, mm. it's between sort of directors and, and managers, there's pretty much Nicola, myself and um, and Lisa. Um, so it's quite, it's we're quite light on women and we, we're mm. quite keen to sort of encourage is um, we would love to see sort of like more women in industry, like um, our engineering type roles and things like mm. that. So that's something that um, we've explored prior, like with the college and things like that, about sort of how you can sort of support more women into those types of roles so it's it's catch 22 I find it's mm. you're trying to sort of be inclusive of all like from the very start of your recruitment process through to sort of the opportunities you give but sometimes it just naturally sort of favors um, a certain group or, or type of person so it's it's hard I think yeah you're absolutely right all right I, I, I mean you you are bound to a degree by the rep by the sector that you're in aren't you that there's, mm. there's an element of assumptions that apl applicants are going to make when you're advertising a job that you're in a male dominated mm. area you're going to be more interested in men um and and naturally you are as you said even in education more men will or more more younger men will be um training to become engineers as you say yeah you, but you we do get sectors that are just more heavily dominated in one or another area so it's exactly that it does just happen um, more naturally so there are things you can do to balance that out and and like thinking about like, how you phrase things the language that you use sometimes in adverts for example trying to make sure that they it, the less some of the language doesn't sound too male dominated yeah that's one thing we looked at um in the space of the last week it's something that I've never really thought about to be honest mm. and, and I'll be honest when I first sort of read up on it I thought I thought it was a bit fluffy and I thought I thought that is mad how how can saying that you're looking for somebody who is um you know hard working can motivate and lead a team how can that be perceived as male mm. um and I know that there's a few tools out there where you can actually run your adverts through sort of um language checkers and uh, yeah, yeah it's quite interesting because originally I was like completely close to the idea and I was like that is crazy whereas when you actually look into it it's surprising and I think mm. they were saying that with men a lot of the time when they read a job advert if they if they think that they can't fully meet the brief they'll sort of apply anyway whereas women yeah. tend to sort of review it and criticize and think oh I can't do that or which is mad completely agree which is why I always say to people doing recruitment make your advert as open and inclusive as possible because I've worked with loads and loads and loads of businesses where they've started from this really like this is our ideal candidate and I've broken it all down to the point where you wouldn't recognise that candidate that it might have applied from the very first advert that they've had. Because we, we often have these assumptions about what, ideally what we need to fit in, what we should really have is quite broad, um, kind of inclusive adverts and just see what you get and where the potential 
because people come from completely left field sometimes and and you think I never would have expected this person would be a good fit for this job and they're perfect it, mm. it's just about being much more um, inclusive um, and again so I think like you say the language is one aspect of it isn't it and I agree with you sometimes you think oh god it's just again it's just box ticking isn't it is it really going to make a big difference but if you've got that compared with your imagery for example so when you're advertising make sure you've got you know um, female representation on your website so when people are checking you out that they can see oh yeah they have actually got women doing this job already that's great because I don't want to be the first woman to go into that all-male environment in that team um, and have women maybe in some imagery on your advert so you're much more likely um, and put some put some and um, post some media posts out there share some case studies around successful women within your businesses it's just all of that package that then helps people to think oh no they really do um they really do um promote women and much more inclusive around women and i guarantee you'll get um, more interest from from female applicants so it's just really challenging what you're doing and, and thinking about it differently sometimes um right where did we get to uh uh, we've talked about yeah we've talked about um unconscious bias haven't we um have a look at any other suggestions around so yeah some of the ways some um organizations do try to avoid unconscious bias is again a being aware of it and just talking about it as a company may be um challenging again around unconscious bias you know what are you know what are we doing um and yes emma sorry i can just see that um, you've made that comment as well about having the same issue in construction and I've worked with um, a few construction businesses actually doing their um, equality and diversity um, policies and absolutely a big issue um, and I know um, one business has got a really good apprenticeship program coming into construction and what they're doing now is they're trying to um, review their app apprenticeship program to try to bring in a percentage of women uh, um, younger women every year into their apprenticeship program and by having that target they're having to look at okay um how are we advertising who which where are we recruiting from are we going to visit schools for example and talking about um what we do and again having those positive role models those good um case studies for women to and, and young women to potentially say um oh yeah great i didn't even think about that as a career wouldn't have even thought they might be interested in me and changing and challenging those perceptions in those environments. Uh, make sure that when you're advertising a job vacancy, you're doing it in at least two different places and try and think about who the target audience is who for that particular um, place that you're advertising. I often say to people, if you know of any community groups, for example, they might advertise your jobs. Go to a few, if you're looking again for, to increase your representation in particular areas, Try to find local communities that might be able to share your jobs um, that you can then potentially likely to increase um, your applicants in those particular areas. Again, get managers to challenge each other on, recruit, on um, recruitment panels. If they notice any potential assumptions or stereotyping, stereotyping can be done in a jokey, like, you know, laid back way. Um, but just make sure that because people sometimes feel uncomfortable about, oh, should I be asking that? Should I be saying, do you think you're making an assumption there? Make it part of the recruitment practice so they actually have to do it and go, are we making assumptions about anybody in this? Is anybody, what does anybody think? Have a chat about it. And um, people sometimes put on um, their application forms, they might take away applicant's name, for example, um, because sometimes you think, oh, that's a name that's hard to pronounce. Um, I assume that that's gonna be a non-British person or um, they even take off the applicant's um, gender. Um, it's called blind sifting, which I think is quite an unfortunate term. Um, but so that you don't actually know and you can't make those assumptions when you're recruiting. Um, something I've come across quite recently is having interviewers on the phone, or having one interviewer on the phone. So they're not making their decision based on the physical appearance of the person being interviewed. So you've got that slightly different dynamic um, coming into play there. And again, always make sure you've got more than one person shortlisting at each different stage because you're going to have different um, perspectives and try to make sure that as much as possible, your panel is diverse as possible, particularly representative of the company or the representation of the company you would like to be. Um, to make sure, sorry. Um, 
and then um, and making sure that you keep a written, written record of any um, why any decisions are made so that you can uh, make sure that if you were challenged, then you're being open and transparent about those decisions. Um, right, have we lost? Oh no, sorry, I thought we'd lost the webinar there. Can everybody still see the webinar? Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Yeah, good, sorry, for some reason I couldn't see the slide then. Um, okay, so um, I've just gone through that list of <laughs> ways to avoid um, unconscious bias. Um, so then, um, so monitoring, so again, just some um, quick ideas really. So we know the traditional forms that you can have that people fill in saying what their, um, their gender, their ethnicity, their sexuality, whether they're disabled, all of those things. When you're a smaller company, sometimes um, companies don't have them because they think, well, we know a lot of those things because um, we can see it, you know, we're a small enough business. Um, but think about, you know, actually, there might be things that people haven't declared. And they don't always declare when they're first recruited. Disability is one of them. And the people think, well, I don't want them to have make assumptions about me, so I'm not going to share that. Um, but actually, if it was, again, anonymous and to, put to one central place that was anonymous, then potentially, again, you'd be more aware as a business and you can make sure you can take account of those things. So it's not just thinking, well, we don't really need it for monitoring. It's thinking what other ways might we be able to use this data in the business. Um, think about having an anonymous staff survey, thinking about people's actual their experiences of um, of inclusion within the business. So to think, actually, you know, what are we doing really well? Where could we be improving, for example? Um, and, you know, um, what what can we um, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. So um, think about also making sure you're looking at where people apply for jobs, um, what's their um, diversity. Um, and versus who actually gets appointed. So we had, um, I don't know, um, 12 women and three men apply for this job, and then um, a woman got the job. So, okay, what was the, you know, how many people applied, how many people were appointed? Does that feel fair? Um, actually, are we getting enough? Is that representative of the company in terms of how many applications we're getting for jobs? And if we're going, if people are going for promotion, um, is again, is that representative of what we've got? Is that representative of where we want to go to? Um, and analyze some of those differences and potentially even investigate it further. You know, what actually is um, working? You know, how did staff really feel about particular policies you've got in place? And um, how you, you might think we want to investigate a bit more how we do, how we did do in this particular recruitment campaign. Um, investigate perhaps or get a survey around. Do people feel that, for example, everybody's demonstrating the values of the company or demonstrating behaviours that they might expect um, people to demonstrate. Do it anonymously and, and, and deal kind of constructively with, with what you get back. It might lead you to make changes to your policy, for example, or your action plan, or to change um, a workplace practice that you've got. Um, if people are feeling excluded or they bring um, it, you know, problems to you or you know, areas of discrimination, Make sure that you're talking openly to people and not making assumptions about what, whether what they say is true or not true and really get the insights into how they feel their work is important to the organisation. Um, again, to, to help your understanding, ask people how they feel um, in their team, in their work and as an organisation as a whole and see how you can help change things to make um, help people to feel um, more included you might easily be able to address um, some of the reasons that they feel excluded, for example. Um, and if, you know, if someone doesn't agree with the values or your culture, they might leave um, and, and hold exit interviews with them if they do to make sure that, again, you can get really good insights into what you're doing well and perhaps um, what you could do differently. I'm just going to briefly, I'm conscious of the time, I'm going to briefly just introduce you to microaggression and give you some examples. Um, because, as I said, it's been seen traditionally as a bit of banter but actually in practice um, it's it's kind of brief and common verbal behavioral and environmental indignities and it might not be intentional but it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who they're aimed at or who who feels that they may be aimed at them in some way um, might still take them you'd be offended by them absolutely rightly so um, even if that was completely unintentional or the person's naive um, and I'll give you some examples of this, which is asking somebody, for example, um, someone of a, a minority ethnic group where they originally came from, or commenting that somebody's name is really hard to pronounce. 
Um, this one that I find particularly difficult myself because I want people to feel that I'm pronouncing their name properly. So my, I might ask, actually, that can be um, seen as an area of microaggression. Asking a black colleague about their natural hair or commenting to a transgender person, well, you don't look transgender. Or saying to someone who's gay that you've also got a gay friend and perhaps you can introduce them. That's seen as something which, again, you might think is a positive thing, but somebody else might see as being um, kind of microaggression. Making comments around um, somebody being crazy or hysterical. We know um, hysteria has traditionally had roots and views about women, um, but also with mental health these days, we need to be really careful about our language and how people perceive our behaviours and that potential link to kind of asylum and um, people's mental health. Um, saying to a disabled person perhaps that they've overcome their disability um, is it might be seem to be inspiring, for example. Actually, that, that could be something that they, they see as an area of microaggression. Or asking an older person if they even know what Snapchat is. Um, you think of it as perhaps potentially funny comment, but that person may not take it to be something as a, a potentially funny comment. Now, I'm mindful that I've got some um, definitions that I was going to go through with you. Sorry, I've done it again, haven't I? Not put the examples up. Um, but um, I'm also conscious of the time. So what I'd like to do is ask um, if anybody has got any questions they want to ask. And then what we might do is circulate afterwards um, some appropriate terms so that you can, you can have those to look at um, after the session. Has anybody got any questions that they want to ask? I do. Sorry, me again. <laughs> no problem at all, Laura. <laughs> um, stemming all the way back to equality, really. And um, one thing I was thinking about um, recently, and um, we've even discussed it a bit internally, is trying to ensure equality now that the workforce is split between home working, office working, and that type of thing. Mm. Um, and um, one thing I think like that could apply is like um, like promotion opportunities mm. or like training, and so. I think that that's one thing that employers need to be quite mindful of. And um, uh, Nicola and I were chatting about it the other day and Nicola was even saying, you know, about introducing monthly calls with the home workers from HR as well as sort of having this standard review meetings and things like that. So, yeah, it's probably more of a point than sort of a question. But I just think that is, is there anything else that you think em employers should be thinking about with regards to ensuring equality now with the the, the split of office location, I suppose. I think um, I think one of the things that I'm always conscious of with home working is actually it's just around relationships generally. You know, where you're in the office, you might all be grabbing a coffee at the same time. You're still working, but you know, you have that sort of five minute chat where you're in the kitchen making a coffee and you you have a chat with somebody. And that's one of the things that doesn't happen so much with people who are home working. So actually, I think it's more importantly, the relationships and actually, again, assumptions and getting to know people properly, because a lot of this stuff you could approach people about and have conversations around if you have those good relationships in place. So actually, yeah. sometimes even thinking about and people think, well, I couldn't possibly do this because it sounds like wasting company time, but actually building in a 20 minute coffee break into with online colleagues, um, because because or saying we're going to add an extra five or ten minutes in the meeting or even just say we're going to for this meeting we're going to make sure that we build in um just a, a tea break a, a 10 minute catch up a general sort of chit chat so that it's not a work focused thing because i think sometimes again the way to be more inclusive is to give people have those good relationships so people can raise anything that might come up at all um, and again, I would say, if you've got questions about what could we do to be more equal, ask the people who work from home. Yeah. You know, they're the ones who will tell you what doesn't feel quite fair or doesn't quite work for them. So do a, an anonymous survey and you'll learn loads, I can guarantee it. Yeah, I just think it's more as we head towards like sort of like internal vacancies and opportunities mm. and things like that I think that it ties in a bit with what you said about unconscious bias you know if, if you're in office with somebody every day you can see hands-on how they're working and and it's sort of making sure that that doesn't creep into any decision I think mm. um, yeah, exactly. you, you got, you're much more likely to have a better relationship well actually you could also have a worse relationship 
you know, if you don't generally get on that well, yeah. it could have the could have the opposite effects, couldn't it? And they could wind you up because they talk too much in the office or, you know, something like that. So yeah, but you you're absolutely right. It is a well known fact that people who are together physically are much more likely likely to have a deeper relationship than people who are working remotely or people who a lot of their work is um, online or working remote. So yeah, you're going to have a much better understanding of whether they're a good, very good fit for the job than the person who's working remotely. So it is about challenging yourselves on that when you are making assumptions sometimes going, well, they didn't say that they could do that, but we know that they can do that, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that happens. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else got a question? I'm quite sure I'm going to give you one last chance when you've got a burning question that they want to ask. And of course, you can always contact me if you do have any questions that you didn't want to ask um, in the session. So I'm mindful that we have just um, run over slightly. And as I said, what I will do is, because um, we've got your contact details, we can share, we can send out, I'll send out, I'll just put together on a, a sheet, just the appropriate terms and some um, definitions. So again, you can, um, for yourselves, have a look at, um, and just make sure you're understanding of what um, some of these terms are. Um, but also one of the things that I was saying, um, Laura, to you, and I think certainly um, everybody can benefit from, is have a look for an inclusive language policy. Because as I say I've come across these over the last year or so. And they, they, what they do is that they, they say things like, um, how, so we might say things like, um, you know, oh, the girls in the office, for example, or the boys in IT. So it's things like that, highlighting that they're common things we might say but actually whether they might be deemed to be appropriate or not appropriate. And actually say, okay, this is what um, you could um, you could actually say instead. Um, Emma, yeah, I'm sure I have got um, some, some policies. Um, so what I'll do is, I, I was gonna put some links on actually with a couple of shortlisting. So when I send out the appropriate terms, I'll send a couple of links as well to a couple of policies um, that you can have a look at. So again, they're gonna be things you're gonna wanna make your own. I'll just send you the policies as they are from those companies that um, I've seen that are good practice. Um, but yeah, I'll put those links on where, with the appropriate terms as well. So you'll have those as a follow up. OK, great. Anybody else got a question or anything else before I let you guys all go and get back on with your day? All good. Thanks, Leslie. No problem at all. Lovely to see you all. And uh, Lisa, did you want to come back in at all? No, no, just to say thanks, Leslie, for giving up your time and for everyone for sticking with us as well, for um, giving up your time today. I know, Leslie, you're working with lots of companies on the AGP um, team with equality and diversity. And we've got Dan who works on the sustainability as well. So I'm guessing they go to the RM in the first case. Yeah, that's if right. Yeah. So if anybody, in fact, I know um, you guys at Gem Power, I think we've already done one. I might be wrong. Um, then yeah if you haven't already got um equality and diversity up to date up to quality and diversity and inclusion policy then yeah there are work packages available at the moment supported by the welsh government um to um put review your policies or to put a new one in place so if you haven't already got one you won't want to be reviewed then go to your rm have a chat um and they are um something that we are doing at the moment with um, all agp clients so thank you yeah, if you think of anything that you would have liked to have asked, but it hasn't come to you yet, then get in touch either with Leslie or through us, and we can get you in touch with Leslie there. Um, uh, know, Leslie, you're going to send the bits to me for me to send out to? Yeah. Yes. As soon yeah, as you find your AG3s, I will send those on to you. And also, if you want to use the recordings as well to take back to managers or to, or to the team as well, um, it usually takes about 24 hours for our recordings to be edited and sent back. Um, but if you want the link to those recordings, then please ask for those as well, and we can get those sent out to you as well. So enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Uh, whether you're watching football tonight or you just couldn't <laughs> give a damn about football, who knows? <laughs> Avoid it. <laughs> Avoid it. I know I'm not sure that I'll be able to watch it tonight, to be fair, but uh, yes, who knows? Have um, a good afternoon. Thanks for joining thank you. us. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.